All right, I think we're gonna get started. So good evening, everyone. My name is Nina Reamer, and I'm one of the co-chairs for the last lecture series committee. Um, thank you all so much for being here tonight, whether you're in this room or connecting virtually. I think we have about 30 people on Zoom. So first off, I would like to welcome Samantha Stetler to the stage. She is our president this year, and she's just gonna share a little bit about Mortarboard. Mortarboard is a national honor society that recognizes college seniors for distinguished achievement in scholarship, leadership, and service. Mortarboard began in 1918 as the first national organization honoring senior college women. It opened to men in 1975, still retaining a part of its purpose to promote and advance the status of women. Mortarboard members have a lifetime commitment to the ideals of Mortarboard, scholarship, leadership, and service. The USD Mortarboard chapter, the Judy Lewis Lowe, I'll call it chapter, was formed in October 2000 and was renamed in October 2020 in honor of its founder, Judith Lewis Lowe. The National Mortar Board Leadership Award awarded, excuse me, our chapter, the Ruth R Weimer Mount Award for chapter excellence in 2006 and again in 2021 for the best mortar board chapter in the country. Each year between those two and after, our chapter has also been recognized as one of the top chapters and we are thankful for all of its members past and present, as well as our leading advisor, Dr. Perla Myers. Now I will hand it back to Nina. All right, thank you, Sam. Um, Mortarboard began hosting the last lecture series at USD in the fall of 2010. The series inspired by Dr. Randy Posh's last lecture at Carnegie Mellon University on the topic of achieving your childhood dreams. Dr. Posh delivered this lecture terminally ill. Thankfully, our speaker today is healthy and we wish him continued health for years to come. Um, the goal of our last lecture series is to provide an opportunity for a distinguished faculty member to consider what they would say when giving a lecture as if it were their last. Now I would like to hand it over to Caitlin, who will introduce you to this year's last lecturer, Dr. Terrell from the Political Science Department. Our speaker tonight is Associate Professor of Political Science and International Relations at USD, and he was recently an esteemed contestant on Jeopardy. He teaches a range of courses related to environmental law and policy, human rights, and sustainable development. His research focuses on environmental justice, natural resource management, marine policy, and the Arctic. Tonight, Mortarboard, in conjunction with the Center for Humanities, is excited to prevent, present Dr. Terrell's last lecture on growth-based versus zero-growth economics. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Terrell to the stage. Well, I, I really want to thank you for inviting me. This is truly an honor. I was a little nervous when I saw it would be my last lecture. I didn't know if this was USD's way of telling me they were reconsidering my tenure decision. Um, it were the more ominous implications. Um, which I should, I should warn you that I've been losing my voice a bit, so there is a chance that I might croak this evening. Um, Joe, croak? Yep, McCarty got it. That's it. That's all I was going for was McCarty. All right. Um, I'm going to talk about development and growth, but I'm also talking more generally or maybe more specifically about how we live our lives. So I'm going to start with the more academic, but I'm going to end somewhere more personal, or at least I hope you feel it is a little bit personal. I'm going to start by talking about these words that are often conflated. Uh, we, we often say growth when we mean development. We often say development when we mean growth. Um, and I, I think it's interesting to go to a, a, a field where this isn't confused. So in the field of, of biology, when we're talking about nature, it's actually pretty clear what we mean when we say growth and development. When we say growth, we're talking about things like increases in cell size, um, which is one part of the life cycle of an organism, whereas development is that entire uh, set of progressive changes in size and shape and function. Uh, one growth that is that is only quantitative, right? It's about size, it's about getting bigger. Whereas development is both quantitative and qualitative. It's about getting bigger and getting better. You know, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I'm going to point out that while growth usually happens to a part of something, Hopefully the organism is developing and growth is just one stage. And we know that growth is not the end goal because we know that we would like greater development to happen and that some growth is not healthy. You have healthy growth and 
regeneration. For example, you want a, a tree, a sapling to grow up very quickly if it can, because otherwise it will be chewed to the ground by a passing you know, deer or something like that. You want a baby, a newborn to grow very quickly because it becomes stronger and that initial growth, those growth spurts are really important. But in neither of those cases, would you hope that that organism continues to grow and grow and grow? In the case of a tree, if it kept growing just quantitatively, it would become too tall and eventually topple over. And what you hope for out of a tree, if you plant a young tree in your yard, sure, you'd like to see it grow for the first few years maybe, but at some point you would like to see it grow out and eventually maybe stop growing altogether and focus on things like budding, like bearing fruit, like being all the things a good tree aspires to be, right? It doesn't want to keep growing. And the same thing for our children, for young people. We don't want them to continue to grow in size. At some point, we want them to take the, the all the energy they have and start to push it in the direction of development, to develop their intellect, to develop their personalities, to develop a sense of ethics and morality. None of those things are quantitative growth, even though we might talk about personal growth. We actually mean personal development. We don't mean that your personality is literally getting bigger and bigger and bigger, although some kids, my own, it feels like that personality is getting a little too big. Uh, we mean that we want to see development, a qualitative change, hopefully for the better. Still, jury's still out on my son. Uh, sustainable, he's out there listening. I gotta be careful. Uh, sustainable growth, hi, hi Theo. Um, sustainable growth is another word that, you know, a phrase that we throw out there. And it's actually not only a misuse of the word growth, it is actually a paradox. Uh, it's impossible to have sustainable growth. In, in a, just a purely um, mathematical sense, at least here on Earth, because all of our energy comes from the sun as a single source. And all of the growth on Earth requires energy. And the sun sends us a finite amount of energy. So while we'll never quite get there, I just want to point out that sustainable growth, and I'm not the first one to point this out, Herman Daly did about two decades ago, is literally impossible. We could not keep growing forever and ever if we wanted to. So talking about it like it's sustainable is, an, is actually a paradox, but it's, it's also misleading. It gives us the feeling like we continue, can continue to just grow and grow and grow without the consequences, the costs of growth because growth comes at the expense of other forms of development. And so when we're talking about growth versus development, the real reason why we want to be cautious about the words we use is because we are it is a zero sum game that we're talking about. We have to focus our efforts on something. And that's not to say we can't develop and grow at the same time, but there are expenditures, there are costs. And we'll talk about that more and more as we, as we go through this um, presentation. Third backup plan? Yeah, okay. So I do want to talk about the costs here and what, what some have labeled uneconomic growth. And that means you're growing, and because we think of that as a good in and of itself, you think, excellent, that was the goal. But it's actually coming at a greater cost than what it's producing. To put it in purely economic terms and in financial terms, every dollar created generates more than a dollar in social and environmental costs. Um, that's why, why it's impossible to really have sustainable growth. We're at a point now where many of our efforts to grow are uneconomic. So, for example, we can generate throughput of money by drilling for oil and selling it to be burned as a fuel. But the climate costs of those activities, not, not to mention sometimes the social costs of the, the um health implications of burning fossil fuels, the implications for the people engaged in the actual um, drilling, all of the costs added up, the transportation costs are actually higher than the amount of economic growth that we've generated. That's uneconomic growth. And a lot of what we're doing these days falls into that category, even though we, we don't like to admit it or we haven't even thought about it. And that's because we can push those costs into the future, which is, in essence, what we're doing. It's your future, though. Most of you, I'm looking out, not everyone, but I'm looking out, a lot of you have many, many, many years ahead of you. And those costs are going to be there um, growing with interest for you. And that interest comes in the form of worsening, worsening climate change. So while we can pretend like everything's okay right now, 
in the future, we know that you know, as we generate um, economic growth through fossil fuels, just to take one example, we are creating economic and social costs into the future. And, and additionally, ecological costs, right? Even, you know, I'm framing it in the way that the most, you know, hard-nosed economics only um, person would, would care. But if you care about the impacts on ecosystems, if you care about biodiversity, which, you know, it itself will come back to bear costs if we let it slip, it's even more staggering how ec uneconomic our growth is. Our un economic growth also has costs in terms of inequality. That is, we are growing in ways now that are that, that, that are widening the gap between rich and poor. And that's both on the macro scale of rich and poor countries and on the, it's not even that micro, but on the domestic level scale of, of all of these countries. Uh, you can see this, if you can see it, this, this uh, um, chart here that, that basically um, tells you the story of a very small percentage of people in the world controlling most of the wealth in the world. So it's not as if we're burning fossil fuels to take that example in, in order to lift the poor out of their poverty. It's primarily going to increase the gap between the rich and the poor. There is some uh, good that's, that's filtering down to the poor, but that's often offset by the health consequences, natural disasters, all of the externalities of climate change that are not brought into the price, the cost of fuel. And it's, it's a worsening and worsening problem. Um, so we're at a stage now where inequality is as, as bad as it's been in, in a very, very, very long time. And we're just kind of going along with this idea that the rising tide will lift all ships. Sure, the, the rich are getting obscenely rich, but the poor are getting a little better off. Again, if, if that were true, maybe it would be worth it. Um, but it's not true when we look at the long-term costs that come from these activities. Um, and we are taking high value natural resources and we're converting them into lower value goods. So take, for example, deforestation. Um, we are deforesting at a, a breakneck speed right now. It's hard to appreciate because we were so lucky to have a planet that is so rich in resources. Um, and we're largely doing that because we need more land for agriculture, because we have dietary habits that are very, very consumptive. Um, we're consuming meat and especially red meat at a, a rate that is uh, that's much, much higher than it's ever been. What used to be a luxury meal is now just your day-to-day, -day, sure, I'll have beef. Um, and that's converting forests that have not even the high value in terms of timber, which is how they used to be seen, um, but the highest value of carbon sequestration, that is saving us from climate change. And we're just taking that away and at the same time, replacing it with another um, very bad activity for climate change, and that is the, the kinds of uh, industrial agriculture that happens when you clear cut a forest and bring in a beef farm. And so we, we are basically taking it, what's, what's a gift, and it's such a gift that we, it's completely underappreciated that we have forests and we have oceans that are trying to save us, that are soaking up carbon dioxide, they're doing their very best, and we're often further degrading them and undercutting their ability to help us. This is a real bummer, I'm sorry, but this is what I talk about. I didn't, did anyone tell you that when you invited me? That it was gonna be all about climate change, jeez, I couldn't believe it. Um, but I'm, it's gonna hopefully get better. And I think if it gets better, it will be because of people like Kate Rayworth. Rayworth is a brilliant economist in the UK. And she came, kind of came up with this model she based it on something else. I won't go into the details of the earlier model, but basically this model is called the donut model because there's this green central donut shaped thing. And that's where we wanna be. We wanna be in the green. And I guess that's pretty obvious being in the red is never good. The outer edge of the, the donut is our ecological ceiling. That is, if we go past that, we are blowing through resources. We are basically degrading um, the earth's uh, systems, it's natural systems at a rate that is unsustainable. And you can see we're already there for biodiversity loss, climate change, land conversion, you know, cutting down trees to have burgers. Uh, what they call nitrogen and phosphorus loading, which is to say pouring chemicals onto our agricultural fields because it's easier to squeeze a little bit more out of them than farming in a way that's in tune with nature. But what she pointed out also is that we don't want to be 
in the whole of the donut either, because the whole of the donut is where people are suffering. And so that's where people do not have access to basic necessities like food, water, energy, healthcare, where there's no not, you know, you don't find social equity or political voice. Um, we have to be somewhere in the middle. So it's not a radical proposition. She's not saying, hey, let's stop developing. She's just saying, let's stop growing. So good development is in that green. We need to use resources. That's how we keep people alive. That's how we keep people healthy and happy. But we have to have a value system that prioritizes regeneration, sustainability, and justice, not just unending growth. And that's our current economic system is measured in unending growth. It's GDP. So we, you know, we're looking for happiness, health, meaning to life. What does it mean to have a good life? Right now, we're measuring how countries are doing and just how much throughput of money is there. How much have they converted natural resources into money? Because make no mistake, every time we have economic growth, we have converted natural resources. It's not really possible to, to have economic growth without some conversion of resources, whether it's a primary conversion or it's way down a supply chain. Everything has a cost. And her question is, are we making high value decisions? It's okay for things to have a cost, but they better have a good outcome then. Better be making somebody happier or healthier or bringing meaning to their life. Right now, it's not clear that we're really thinking about how the good of GDP, you know, how GDP attaches to any good. We're assuming it's a good in and of itself. And that may be true. A growth in GDP could is very, very good for a poor country. We'll get there in a moment. I'm not suggesting that there aren't countries where you need that kind of growth, just like a, tr a tree in one of its life cycles needs a lot of growth, just like a young person needs a lot of growth initially. There are some countries that are in a stage where growth is very important. The growth of their economy is essential. But there are many countries, and we live in one of them, where we're beyond that growth. Our growth is uneconomic. It's not making us happier or healthier or bringing meaning to our lives. It's just growth for growth's sake. The problem is, what would that transition look like if we stopped trying to just grow? How hard would that be? In addition to having to convince people, which is perhaps the hardest part, I don't know how I'm doing so far. So, you know, I don't know if you're all on board, but even if we could convince everybody, realize that we've predicated all of our systems on this growth. So the this, uh, you know, I don't know if you can fully make this out, but basically this is showing, uh, starting in 1945, right up until about 2020, the relative size of young people, population of young people to older people. And basically our whole social security system is dependent upon there being more younger people, that is growth rate in population, than older people. It's a pyramid scheme and another way of looking at it. The older people are banking on more young people so that you know if you all give a little bit of your pay, you can support one of those older people. But since we've actually seen less population growth recently, we have a bit of a crisis. And it's not just here, it's even worse in other countries like Japan. In Denmark, they're, they're actually agreeing to pay for people's vacations if they can prove that they conceived during their vacation. And I kid you not, that's how worried they are about population. They call the program Do It For Mom, and it's all, all their advertisements are based on like weeping grandmothers or would-be grandmothers who just don't have grandkids. They are trying to guilt people into it, and they're bribing people into having kids. That's how attached we are to these systems. Housing market's the same way. What if I told you you're going to buy your house? And in 10 years, it's going to be worth exactly the same amount or less if you didn't keep it up, or maybe a little bit more if you add it on a porch. That's not what we expect. People buy houses now and they expect it to be a moneymaker, an investment. They expect to retire off of it. If you're from San Diego and you're ready to move to a, another part of the country, you can literally sell your house and have a retirement. If you didn't have a growth-based system, that's not how it would work. When you think about it, it's not logical that it should work that way. Why should your house be worth more if you didn't make it any better? Or worse yet, if you let it kind of fall apart. In San Diego, you could let your house basically fall apart and make hundreds of thousands of dollars in a few years. It's, it defies rational thought, yet we're so used to it and so dependent on it that it's hard to imagine letting it go. 
Imagine a stock market where it actually mattered which stock you picked. Not like a day trader, like every person had to invest in the right stock because if you invest in the wrong one, you'd lose money. See, right now, the way that investments work is just broadly invest in a portfolio because it's all going up. Why? Because we've built growth into the, into the very premises of our system. If you change to a, a zero growth model, there could still be a stock market, but you'd literally be choosing a company and betting on them to do better. And if you chose poorly, you, they, you know, you'd lose your money. That can happen, but most people don't invest that way. Now, most people put it into a 401k and you're supposed to not look at it for a few years. And before you know it, you've got retirement. These systems wouldn't work. We would have to totally re-engineer our society, which sounds very, very hard. But does it sound harder than dealing with unending natural disasters? Does it sound harder than dealing with waves of migration because people are finding their homes to be uninhabitable? We're already seeing it and we're ignoring it. There are parts of Central America that are drying out quite quickly. This is why we have so much migration from parts of Central America right now. We're just pretending like it's a blip. Oh, weird, there's migration. I don't know. The drought in Syria, it's not the only cause, maybe not even the primary cause, but it is one of the primary causes for all of the unrest in, in that region and all of the, the refugee crisis that has come from that. It's only going to get worse. And so when we think about how hard this would be to make this transition, we should not be comparing it against the status quo, but the future, the future where things are hard in other ways. And we can have a graceful transition now. I don't know how graceful it will be, but more graceful than waiting for things to fall apart. All right, this is working again. And there is an organic, more graceful way to do it, and it's through shifting societal values. I have this happiness report um, index here. And what I want you to notice is a big part of happiness is wealth. That's undeniable. The, the wealthiest countries are among the happiest. But it's not true that the wealthiest are the happiest. All of these countries are wealthy, but it's not that the richest ones are at top. The ones that are at top, Finland, Denmark, Iceland, Switzerland, Netherlands. So look, make no mistake, those are wealthy countries. But those are also countries that have bought into other kinds of values that, that keep them towards the top. There's a reason why the US and the UK are not usually near the top. They're very wealthy countries as well. But there's something about the Scandinavian model that, that has you know built bought into a, a lifestyle that is focused more on relationships, on trust, on min minimalism. If you think about even design, right? This idea that life isn't about all of the things that you can gather, but it's about relationship. You think about some of the terminology that that comes out of of the Sc Scandinavian way of life. You know, things that, that focus on being cozy, and being about being surrounded by family, about warmth, about getting through a tough winter. <laughs> often, it's. We have to move. We would have to move away from these ideas that promote consumerism. We've really bought into the idea that buying things can make you happy, to the point where when people have disappointments in life and they have a bad day, often the first thing we think to do is to go buy something, to go shopping, to you know nowadays get online and just you know get that little bit of of uh, sort of endorphin rush from purchasing. We've kind of bought into buying. Uh, we have to get away from the competitive thinking that that our lives should be measured against each other, and somehow we can look around and see who has what, and you know what brand is somebody wearing, what car are they driving, and think that's what makes my life valuable. We would have to move away from that. More or less, we have to move away from the idea that bigger usually equals better. And I've got this rather silly illustration here, but I don't know, I couldn't resist it. This idea that you know one fish is looking at the other and think, thinking. Oh, uh, that one has everything they need. They're so free. And I'm not sure which one is thinking that. Maybe they both are. Or maybe it's not the one you think, right? The the, you know, I don't know. They're probably both miserable. They're goldfish stuck in a in a goldfish uh, jar. So I don't know. It looks pretty bad. But you know, you'd rather be the small one, right? At least if you have to be a goldfish stuck in a goldfish bowl, you'd pick the small one who has enough space to move around. In that case, bigger is not better. Um, 
but the more I look at it, the sadder I get. And somehow that's after talking about climate change. So let's move on. Um, it's especially hard because we've been conditioned to think like this. And um, I, I will say to you students in the audience, you've been conditioned to think like this, especially. Um, I went to high school in a time where, yeah, you wanted to do well, but I'll be honest, it was a lot easier on us. You know, there wasn't this idea that, that you know, we're all in, in fierce competition with one another and everyone had to try to achieve like this unthinkably high GPA. And on top of that, do every activity and, and do all the AP classes you could. There were always overachievers, but um, I say this, you know, I have a four-year-old, so what do I know? But when I talk to my, my friends who have old, you know, kids in high school, it sounds like the, the pressure is crushing at times. Um, and on top of that, you have the, the normal worries that were always there about social status in high school. It's a time when people are sort of realizing that we compare as humans, we, we compare ourselves against each other. And it's a tough time that, you know, there's a real sadness when, when kids transition away from just being able to be friends and who cares? No, nope, I don't know, brands, who cares? Who cares? And, so, and all of a sudden you have to super care. You know, are you wearing the right clothes? Are you hanging out with the right people? Are you doing the, the right activities? Um, and then, of course, there are family expectations, and, and that pressure is is even worse when your family is hoping for you to achieve a certain result, or act a certain way, or be a certain person. If you can't fit those ideals, and then it's not much better here, right? We get here, and I, as a pre law advisor, uh, I talk to a lot of students, and I can't tell you that the admissions process isn't telling them to to do all of these things all over again. Um, although I will tell you, as pre law advisor. Uh, many of these things don't matter as much as you think. So come talk to me if, if you are interested. But we're taught to just be totally careerist about everything, right? You're here, you're in this amazing uh, place where you can learn all kinds of things, meet all kinds of people. And we immediately tell you, you have to think about what you're going to do immediately after college. And it should be a career. And it, you know you should be planning this out 10 years into the future. It's a lot of pressure and it completely undermines the beauty of being able to explore here. We tell people, not only do you have to pick your major, but you should have maybe a major and a minor, or maybe two minors, or maybe a double major and a minor. Uh, that stuff actually doesn't matter as much as anyone thinks, but that doesn't take away the pressure because you do have peer expectations too. If you're talking to your friends and they're doing a double major, they're thinking about their career, they're talking about internships all the time, of course you feel like, you ought to do the same. We focus completely on outcomes rather than the processes here. It's, I'm about to say something cheesy, like it's all about the journey or something like that, but really it kind of is here. It is about being in it when you're here and enjoying every moment of it. You won't get this chance again. And I know I'm talking to you when it's a bit too late, but oh, I'm just gonna make you sad. You'll never have this chance again. But um, this was a real privilege, wasn't it? to be here and be able to take classes and be around people who are, you know, hopefully dynamic, wonderful, intelligent people um, who are interested in things that, you know, that you're interested in. But what we see instead is the mental health is especially um, tough right now for, for people, uh, for young people, for, for Gen Z, as they say. Um, you know, it's tough on everyone, but it's been especially bad recently for, for, for younger folks. And so we can tell that things are not headed in the right direction. And this is where I'm trying to tie in the personal, because this is all related. The fact that we have an economy that is built on growth is very much connected to you being pushed to get out there and produce, right? You have to do that. If you ever were to say, actually, that's not my value system. Actually, that's not what I want my life to be all about. It would start to undermine the system. I'm, I'm hoping that you're on board with undermining the system, right? Because I just told you it was totally unsustainable. We have to start to question these things. High school should be a time when you're trying to figure out who you are and what you want to do with your life. And it's not that at all. If everyone has to take the same 12 APs and join every club and try to be the, the leader of that club and worry about what everyone thinks about you and worry about what your family wants, of course, it's hard in high school because you're just figuring everything out. But you know, we have a responsibility here on campus to make sure that's not what your experience is like. And I'm afraid that some of us are failing in that. You know, I see, I hear that people are being pushed 
to think way too early about majors, way too early about internships, way too early about what comes next. Um, it's 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 really very sad because this is such an extraordinary opportunity, not just for you personally, but an opportunity for us to collectively think, what do we want our society to look like? So what can we do to shift these societal values? Well, I'm a political scientist, so I'll always say you should vote, but not for the reasons that you think. Um, this, show, this is basically meant to show you that we're at this extraordinary moment and we're, it's even a little bit um, the green is a little bit higher than the, the gold at this point because this stopped in 2018. Um, we're at this extraordinary moment where younger generations are now um, you know, able to outvote older generations. Now, I'm, I don't, I'm not throwing shade at older generations. There are plenty of folks in older generations who want to see really important change. What I am saying is generational change has the capacity to change the rules. You could just say, I don't want our system to look like that. I don't want our lives to look like that. And one way to do that is to tell politicians because they're not leaders, they are followers. They are waiting to hear what their marching orders are because ultimately they want to get reelected. Ultimately, they're not gonna take chances, except for a few. Most politicians aren't gonna take chances unless they hear people saying, yeah, please do that. Yeah, please fight for that. And they won't hear that unless you let them know at the ballot box. But there are also ways that you can resist consumerism. Look, I'm not gonna tell you that any of this will matter on its own, it won't. Your vote is not never likely to win an election. Your consumer you know, choice as a consumer is never likely to be a difference maker. But it's only if enough people go out on that limb and do these things that as a generation, you could be a difference maker. Right, that's the tough thing about these. It's you know, it's a drop in the bucket, but there is a bucket, and you do want to fill it, right? And so, if everybody isn't doing their part to fill it, the bucket will never fill. We'll never hit that tipping point where all of a sudden we can kind of get rid of these expectations that are frankly not making us very happy. Um, we can, you know, absolutely make choices like reusing, repairing things, sharing things, trading things. I don't know. I'll tell you. We don't buy very many things anymore because we joined a, a neighborhood group called Buy Nothing. Anybody ever heard of that? This is on Facebook. It's on Facebook, so you're you're all over Facebook. I know. I mean, you're like done with Facebook, right? So I don't know until they get on TikTok. I'll have to do a dance to try to give away something. I don't know, uh, um, and you know, point to things, point to words above my head. But um, anyhow, yeah. Right? Am I wrong though? <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, this is a group where when we're done with, you know, baby clothes, when we're done with when something we're like, ah, we're never going to use that. We put it out there and say, hey, please, somebody come take this for free. If we have some food that's going to expire, we're going away for the weekend. We're like, ah, it's going to be bad by the time we come back. Put it out there. And there are people who come right to your porch and say, yes, thank you. And we're doing the same thing. You know, as our son gets older, he loves Legos. I could go out and spend $50 on Legos and have more plastic production. Or I could say, hey, when anyone got Legos? And like a million people were like, yeah, I've got Legos and I keep stepping on them. They hurt my feet. Please take them out of my house um, before my kid notices. So it, there are lots of ways that you can be part of this. And we should start to change the values behind it too. appreciate the durability of things. You know, my, my poor phone is barely making it, but man, it's trying, you know, and it's from 2018. And I know that's like ancient, but it's trying and I appreciate, where is it? There it is, buddy. You're doing a good job, you know, keep going. We should appreciate the ability to repair something, to keep something going. There's, there's a real, it went off Netflix. There was this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful series called Repair Shop. Did anyone ever catch that? It said in the British countryside, there are like, you know, bucolic things everywhere. And it's just these people in a barn repairing old stuff. And it was so satisfying to watch. We have to tap into that. They would take something that looked broken down and ready for the dumpster and they would shine it up. It was beautiful. We're clever. We're clever animals. We don't have to just keep churning out the same stuff that we're going to throw away. We're good at things. We're good at making things, designing things, fixing them. We have to appreciate that. We have to talk about these things. We really have to talk about these things because that's the only way change comes. We have to normalize that we want things to be different. 
And that's maybe the hardest part because it's a downer to talk about this stuff. It is. It's a real downer. And it's it's easier to just say, hey, did you get the newest iPhone? Blah, blah, blah. Be excited about it. That's like an easy conversation. A harder conversation is, why is my phone dying every two hours? Well, because I don't really, you know, I don't know. I should probably get a new phone. But, um, <laughs> now that I said it. but you know, we have to have those hard conversations. Like, I'm going to try to squeeze every last bit out of this. I, I really like to go get that old bike fixed and, and try to keep it going. Um, or maybe even the deeper stuff. Like, I don't want my life to be about generating economic growth. I want my life to be about something that matters. I want it to be something I care about. I want it to be connected to something that I find valuable. It's only if we start at that level that I really think we can hope to have the change that we would like to see at the higher levels. Yeah, there are all kinds of policymakers working on things. Kate Rayworth is teaming up with Amsterdam to try to figure out how to do life cycle analysis of all their systems. That's great. Let them do that. We need that too. But we also need just folks talking about stuff and saying, hey, why do we create junk that we're just going to throw away? Why do we have all of this extra packaging? Why do we have so much pressure to do things that we don't really want to do? Why are we always told that we have to be productive? Why are we, you know, I'll say something super controversial. Why are we taught that being hardworking is like the highest value? I'm not saying it's good to not work. But why are we trained that we should be spending all of our life's energy? And that's how we can tell if we're virtuous. There are so many ways to be virtuous. And working hard in the right moments is one of them. But there are also building relationships. That's a really virtuous thing to do, being there for people, being compassionate and helping. We focus on the things that generate growth because the system needs us to and because we're given all kinds of carrots and a lot of sticks if we don't. Uh, but we can change those rules. You can more than I can because I'm about to die apparently or at least about to get fired. So who knows what I can do at this point. But um, I will point out, I'll end with this. If Even if you thought, well, that sounds good, but I got to make the money. I'm going to point out to you that making money doesn't actually make people happy after a certain point. The richer a family gets, the smaller the reduction in negative emotions gained by the marginal dollar increase. They couldn't have said it in a more confusing way. But basically, what it means is, you can see when you're poor, every dollar does make you happier because you're buying things you need and that are meaningful. It's meaningful if you grew up poor. I grew up kind of poor, and going out once a month to a restaurant was super meaningful. Having extra dollars to do that made me feel like I had a small luxury. If you're rich and you can go to a restaurant any night, it's no longer super meaningful, especially when at some point the extra dollar doesn't even get you that. It gets put in a bank somewhere or it gets invested in something meaningless to you, like a slightly more fancy luxury car or a slightly or even much bigger house that actually might make you less happy. You get the bigger house and instead of the little garden you used to take care of, now you have to hire a gardener. And not only are you thinking, oh, you know, this is just another thing I have to manage, but you no longer even get the happiness of taking care of your own garden, right? There's these all these little ways that we, geez, all these little ways that we undermine our own happiness without even realizing it, right? We we think we're going to be better and better off, but at some point you can see we have diminishing returns. You know, we're in expensive San Diego, so I don't know. This says eighty thousand dollars for a family. That sounds like nothing in San Diego, to be honest. But you know, in Kansas, it probably goes a long way. But let's say it's more in San Diego. It 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 undoubtedly is. At some point, though, you're going to get to some point wh where that extra dollar won't be very meaningful, except we're taught to value it, except we're taught to value ourselves by it. And that's the most perverse part. It actually makes us less and less happy. You know, it says here at $200,000, there's no marginal gain. If you actually extrapolate this out, I've seen research that suggests at some point, more wealth makes you actually sadder. You start to compete with wealthier and wealthier people. Your life is less connected to the things you care about. You're more and more detached from things that make you happy. And you spend more and more of your energy just trying to get more and more money. Um, so I, I'm, I wanted to end here because I don't want you to think I'm saying self-sacrifice. I'm saying that this is actually a way to be happy. Yes, money is an important part. Just like the poorest countries need that growth, the poorest families need more. And, and we as a society should be helping them get what they need. 
But there is a point where you'll have decisions, I hope, that you can say, do I want to, to sacrifice my life in the pursuit of more growth? And you'll have an opportunity to say, no, I'd rather use my life in higher value ways. And I guess I, I'm hoping you'll ask yourself, what does a good life look like to me? You know, what would give me higher quality of life, not just quantity in my bank account? And ultimately, it comes down to a big question. It's kind of the question I want to leave you with, it, which is right here in bold. So you can't miss it. How do we envision ideal partners, families, work, communities? What do those look like in ways that would bring us meaning? That are not about like how big they can be or how much they can grow them, but how much happiness we can derive from them, how compassionate we can be, how we, how we can support each other, how we can help each other to a good life. Okay, I sound like a big hippie, so I'm going to leave it there. It's I'm going to get even hippier if I'm not careful. Um, I just I really wish you all the best. I'm going to say since it's my last lecture, I want to leave by saying I wish you all the best, and I wish you all truly the best. Not the best as it's been defined by others, not the best in a way that kind of leaves you just trying to keep it going, trying to, you know, keep pursuing, but the best where you can actually be content, where you can actually find a life that is full of meaning. Thank you again for inviting me here. I guess I'd stay. Do I stay here? Or do I... <laughs> ah. Well, thank you all so much for being here and thank you so much as well. Um, we know that Thursday nights are a busy time. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, and we especially appreciate your time and care. And um, I'm sure this is all very valuable to all of us and everyone on Zoom as well. Um, so before you go, we just want to offer you a small little gift. Well, thank, thank you, you very much. Coming. That's totally unnecessary. Thank you so much. I was That's just cool. happy to be here. Um, as long as I'm not losing my job, I'm, I'm totally happy. <laughs> I don't think so. Well, thank you all for coming. There's treats like, if you want some. So. Are, are there any questions? Do we have time? For oh, yes, we questions? have time for questions as well. Um, so if anybody has any, please feel free. Yes, sir. How is there um, programs underway to try to redefine what is domestic product to include things like happiness and all the other things? And if so, how far along are those? Uh, how far along are those studies? Well, I mean, it's. I mean, there, this is a, there are several indices like this that exist. Now, it, combining them, this does combine them. This, this happiness report looks at wealth in addition to a lot of other factors. And it doesn't come out with surprising results. And, and that is, you know, you would, you can't, it's not that you look at any of these countries and say, I can't imagine people are happy there because they're, you know, facing such, you know, terrible poverty. Costa Rica may be the most surprising one on this list. Um, Costa Rica has really invested in its happiness, um, in including protection of natural areas, shifting its economy away from production and towards, you know, tourism and things that can help to preserve the, its, you know, stunningly gorgeous natural resources. Um, and it's invested a lot in its social safety nets and and basically it's a pretty nice life, even though it's not a, a wealthy life. So it, the, this does attempt to combine that. The challenging thing is if you want to quantify, you can't really quantify happiness in a direct way like you can you know, GDP, right? You can survey people, but, but you're never going to, it's apples and oranges, right? So they do, they do their best here. They, they use survey mechanisms. They, they use all different kinds of measurements, but a hardcore economist is always gonna balk at something like a survey of how happy you are, or even these indirect ways of measuring happiness. Um, it's easier to use GDP, and yet it yields a result that doesn't really tell us what we're looking for, right? It tells you something about how much money is moving through, not who's moving the money, not anything about inequality, not anything about quality of life, but it's sure easier to use. And so we tend to fall back on that, but we already have lots of other options out there. We just have to take them seriously. That's a good question, though. Yeah, but a lot of people have put thought into how to measure what it looks like to have a good society. You, they did at some point with one of those, and theirs was much more survey-based. So this is trying to combine other metrics um, because it's not to get into the, the weeds here too much, but there's a fear that if you just ask people how, how happy you are, you have some cultural norms that might come into play that just 
you know, if, if in your culture, you're supposed to say you're happy, maybe you're more likely to say you're happy, regardless of your happiness, things like that. So I think some folks want to shy away from simply asking, are you happy, and trying to measure it in a variety of ways. Oh, sure. So there's an entire field called environmental economics. And they look at things like, hey, you cut down the, this swath of forest, how much carbon could it sequester? And you know, how much, uh, you know, would it's, it's very hard math. And it's, you know, you have huge error bars usually because we're, we can't be totally sure about some of these things. But you can say, how much is that likely to contribute to climate change? Now, that one small, small swath is not going to do much on its own. But if we continue to cut swaths like that, um, we, yeah, there are all kinds of different ways to measure the loss in what we call ecosystem services. You know, you cut down, not only did you cut down that, that swath of forest and now we have a climate change problem, uh, you know, that's adding to, but that forest was helping with filtration, it was helping with erosion control. And you can start to think, okay, how much would it cost to rebuild that bank? You know, how much if we have to build a water treatment plant because we no longer have good filtration, how much does it cost to, to build and operate that water treatment plant? So yeah, there's an entire field that even tries to quantify like, what is the forest worth aesthetically? Well, I don't know, you could ask people and they could give you some weird numbers, but there's a market out there that tells you that. And, and you know, it's the real estate market. If you have a house that's in a forested area, is it gonna be worth more than a house that's just clear cut, you know, no trees at all? Yes, it is. Is there, a, you know, we know houses with water views are worth more than houses without. We can quantify what is a clean, you know, river worth you don't want a river that's you know, choked up with pollution that doesn't give you and that actually is probably a drag on your home's value so there are all kinds of tools that they use to try to figure these things out but but some are pretty straightforward when you have a loss of ecosystem services and we have to build artificial things and operate them to replace those services yeah well and then i think the closest way i that i can think of it interacts is something called a uh, Kuznets curve for the environment. And that's an economist's way of talking about, um, the idea is that as countries get richer, they, they, they have to pollute to get rich because that's our model right now is, you know, industrialization makes you richer, but industrialization is dirty. But as they get so rich, they start to think, oh, it's really dirty and the river's on fire and you can't see LA because of the smog and they start to clean up. Um, but and, and so that the idea is, hey, just let everything go because as countries get richer, as they industrialize, they'll all clean up. But the flaw in that theory is we don't actually clean up. We just send the dirty stuff elsewhere, right? So we no longer have as many factories in the US. We make sure that they're over the border in Mexico and that's where the pollution is. And so the problem is every country can't go through that process because some countries have to be the producers, right? Um, and it's really a... a clear example of how we still operate in a very uh, colonized world, right? It's just economically colonized. The dirty stuff is pushed elsewhere. Um, and the we we get the benefit of cheap goods uh, and and you know very uh, you know, good access to to products. And the folks that are actually producing them are have health consequences, environmental consequences. Um, and so this we never get to that. So I think that's the closest to to that theory that there's some like curve you're going to get over and then everyone's going to kind of make it. Um, and it was very popular because it makes us feel good. Like everyone will make it eventually if we just keep churning and churning. But as we've seen, um, some countries aren't making it and the world's economy depends on them not making it. And it happens internally too. You know, the US economy st is still very much driven by some of the poorest parts of the country that are doing the industrial work. So it's it's happening internally and externally. Sir. Yeah, I have a question. So I know that Iceland, for example, like 80% of their energy comes from renewables. Do you think that kind of correlates in any way to like overall population happiness or what do you see as the trend? There's a lot going on in Iceland that leads to happiness. Um, they have one of the longest running democracies too. And that's, they're a small population um there's there's a lot going on they're lucky to have those natural resources that are basically built on top of volcanoes so they get a lot of free energy um i wouldn't say it's one thing but that certainly doesn't hurt right the fact that they their energy production comes in in the form of clean and cheap renewable energy certainly takes pressure off it means that you don't have a dirty energy sector it means that you know even in a very cold place like iceland there is plenty of heat when necessary um, but there's there's so many other things going on. They've they've built a culture that is egalitarian. Uh, 
Uh, they've got some really amazing music for a place that has 200 and 300,000 people. You know, they've, they've got, they've got cultural things happening. I mean, I don't, I think it's a little silly to mention music and I also think it's not like they are a very creative society for such a small society. So they've got a lot going on, but it does not hurt for sure to have access to, to clean, cheap, renewable energy. Um, but we all have access to it. They have especially easy access to it, but if we wanted it, we could, and we didn't think of it as, it has to make money, but it's just an investment. We could have it just like trains. You know, if we didn't have this silly idea that trains should make money and we were, aren't, weren't always asking, does Amtrak turn a profit? We could actually look at trains at what, you know, as what they're supposed to be, which is an investment in society that makes our lives better. You know, we don't say to the fire department, did you turn a profit last year, right? We invest in the fire department because it keeps people safe. You know, we, we don't ask services to turn a profit they're there to serve society and a good train system should be that and we should probably think about at this point energy that way like instead of making it all about like st solar startups that can can be very profitable if we just said we want to do this we could do it we could invest as a society and make sure that everyone is it has access if you want to put on rooftop solar we shouldn't be saying hey here's a good deal on a loan we should be saying yes do this you're going to save us. You're going to save especially future generations, everyone who chooses. We should make it something you want to do, not something that's some, you know, complex financial decision that your family has to make. Um, but we bought into this idea that everything has to turn a profit. Everything has to be about growth. And we're even the solutions we're, we're judging by that same standard that got us into trouble, which is deeply sad. Oh, yes. Oh, in the back there, sorry. In, in, in terms of the Arctic, uh, with the changes to the yield management, uh, it's easy to talk about degrowth, but like Russia and then China, which considers it kind of a kind of quasi Arctic country. Yeah. How do you feel about Russia and China in terms of uh, extracting uh, the resources from the Arctic? Is it going to be a contested area? Uh, I'm sure it will be a contested area. Um, I guess I have to have the same hope in those generations too. Like I, instead of saying, what do you say to Russia and China as if those are people, I think it's more like, what do we say to the young generations in Russia and China that are going to have the same kinds of lived experiences of a, a harder and harder life, right? I think we have to hope that this same um, shift in values can happen in those places because Russia and China, is, you know, those are countries made up of people. And so I, I to fully take your point. I think strategically, the Arctic is going to be contested. There are a lot of resources there, including fossil fuels. I guess I have to hope that enough of the world turns so that the incentives change, so that our system is no longer run that way. It's not an easy answer. And I wish, you know, Kate Rayworth says the same thing. That's why I was, you know, want to make it clear this isn't a policy it is a set of values. And I think I'm saying the same thing here. There are really brilliant people who are thinking very hard about Arctic policy, especially when it comes to security. And that is going to be a major issue. And God bless those people for thinking about that. It's grim stuff. Um, I'm, I'd like to, you know, focus on my part, at least what I'm talking about right now, which is to say, those same issues are true for young people in China and young people in Russia. They are facing uh, some many of the same problems and uh, and problems we can't even imagine in the U.S. Right, and and then we have problems they can't even imagine. But one thing we're we're all in it together when it comes to like if we keep, you know, we're we're in a, a death drive right now, and it won't matter who has control of the Arctic if if we make things bad enough in a in a more general way and so i'm i guess i'm hopeful that those young generations have similar thoughts and i think they do from from what i've seen and it's hard to get you know, those aren't places where it's easy to speak out right but from the indications we have young people are pretty concerned in in china and russia and all over the world about where we're headed so i guess i have to hope for that and leave it to the brilliant you know strategist to deal with the security side one thing I will say is I, um, where I went to grad school, it was our, our dean was actually an admiral. And when he did say that he thinks climate change is one of the biggest parts of national security and should be going forward. Yes. Hi, this is Mark. Uh, <laughs> and I got to ask you this question. I'm really curious. Think about where I want to be young people. 
You are. What are you, 23? We're always looking for these young people looking to have sort of new values, changing values. Um, where do you think, given that, as you've demonstrated persuasively, the prevailing values that you're just inculcated with are these sort of narrow, almost nihilistically growth based values? Where would a young person looking for these other values look? Do you imagine that these are new values that will have to be created and developed? Or do you imagine that there are storehouses of these values in other traditions, in the past, even the ancient past, perhaps, uh, you know, in, in different, different places? I'm, I'm curious for you to say something. I mean, absolutely. And they should definitely learn about Plato with you is, is, is that what you're fishing for? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. No, I know these ideas are already out there, right? And I think they're in our lives. We can just, we're only allowed to acknowledge them in the right circumstances, right? It, when we talk about community and we talk about, you know, appreciating um, items because they make our lives meaningful, these are things, these are not unfamiliar things. When we talk about, you know, what is meaning in life? If I ask most people what makes your life meaningful, I don't. Only the crassest people would be like, just a just a pile of money. I just we know where we talk about family. We would talk about doing something we care about. We would talk about the arts. Hopefully, uh, one way of getting at this is if I said, okay, you get to retire tomorrow. What are you going to do? Most people would come up with something kind of meaningful. You know, they would read books if that's their love. They would spend time with family. They would travel. They would take up some kind of art. They would garden. These are all things that bring meaning to our lives. We know that. You know, you know we, we don't say, uh, well, I don't, I'm just going to keep working until I die because of the money. If I, if I you know, I, again, I'm hoping this isn't my retirement speech, but if they, somebody said, what do you want to do after you retire? I would actually say, I want to teach, but not for the money. I would do it for, I shouldn't say that out loud. I would definitely not do it for free. Of course, I want to get paid. Um, but seriously, I love this. And this brings meaning to my life. And so it is one of the things, like I think if and when I retire, you know, that kind of connection. I mean, I find what we do in the classroom and, and outside the classroom, talking to students, advising students, just getting to know students to be incredibly meaningful. The community we have here means so much to me. I think we we see those things in our own lives, but we're just taught to ignore them. We're taught to set them aside and be realistic, be you know practical. It's very practical to want to have a happy life. It's the only practical thing. Now, sometimes that takes money, but sometimes you don't need more money for that. And it's like discerning the difference. Like, okay, I have to do a job regardless of whether I like it or not, because I got to pay the bills. Sure, that's a reality for many people. And it, it may be a reality for you for all of your life, but there are hopefully things you do outside your job. And if you're really lucky, your job can be that meaningful thing, right? We have to kind of discern like, okay, when do I have to be super practical? But it's not our jobs to just drive the economy. You know, it's not our job to just make sure that we are worker bees that are going to keep it all going. It's our job to find meaning in life, to find happiness in life, and to make sure other people can do the same. So if it's, you know, it's out there. It's If, if you don't know what brings you meaning, then, then I think it's just sitting with that question for a while. Like, what actually makes you happy? Put aside the stress. Put aside the fear. Put aside the pressure from whoever. What do you like? What would make you feel like that was a life well well lived? Sounds corny, right? But I think it's true. Like when, you know, you could do the deathbed thing. Yeah, looking back, what would make you, what would you be? Isn't that a nice thought? I mean, it may sound unrealistic depending on how you think about death, but what would make you have a little smile on your deathbed and think, yeah, you know, that was good. I did that right. Sure, I have some regrets. Sure, I have some sadness, but... I made some good choices. Usually it's not that extra buck, right? I don't know. Is that too sappy? It feels like that's a good place to leave things, isn't it? Thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure. I really appreciate it. all for coming that's all we have for tonight but um if you all want to stay